It was the most dangerous seven minutes in computing history. On July 20, 1969, a quarter of a million miles from Earth, humanity's fate rested on a computer with less power than a modern pocket calculator. Inside the lunar module, the Eagle, alarms began to blare. Alarms that no one, not even the engineers in Boston who built the system, had ever expected to hear during a landing. They were alarms signaling a crisis, a computer overloaded, on the verge of crashing, and the world was holding its breath. This is the story of the Apollo Guidance Computer, or the AGC. It was the brain of the Apollo spacecraft, the first integrated circuit-based computer ever put into space. It was a marvel of its time, weighing about 32 kilograms, 70 pounds, and packed into a tiny, elegant box. It could handle a few thousand calculations per second, by comparison, today's smartphones can perform trillions. But what the AGC lacked in brute force, it made up for in elegant design. Its operating system was a masterpiece of real-time computing, designed to handle multiple tasks simultaneously, prioritizing the most critical ones. The engineers called it priority scheduling. The AGC constantly had a list of jobs to do. Track the spacecraft's position. Calculate the engine burn. Process crew inputs. Each job was given a priority level. If a new, higher priority task came in, the AGC would temporarily stop what it was doing handle the urgent request, and then pick up where it left off. This was a sophisticated system, an executive program that would never let a low-priority task prevent a critical one from executing. But the true genius of the system wasn't just in its elegance, it was in its resilience. The AGC was designed to fail gracefully. This was no accident. It was the result of a happy, almost unbelievable turn of events during early testing, thanks to the foresight of one of the most brilliant minds on the program, lead software engineer, Margaret Hamilton. Hamilton and her team at Draper then known as the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory, were tasked with programming every command, every contingency. They had to account for human error and hardware failure in ways no one ever had before. During an early simulation for the Apollo 8 mission, Margaret's young daughter Lauren was visiting the lab. While playing, she accidentally triggered a pre-launch sequence while the simulator was already running a different program. The system crashed. This seemingly insignificant event was a revelation. It revealed a bug no one had ever considered, the possibility of a crew member accidentally loading an incorrect or redundant program at the wrong time. Hamilton realized that if this happened during a mission, it could be catastrophic. The AGC could be overwhelmed, not by a hardware malfunction, but by a simple human mistake. And so Margaret Hamilton and her team built in additional error prevention software. They didn't just fix the bug, they fortified the entire system. They programmed the computer to not only recognize an overload, but to do something about it. The computer would automatically drop lower priority tasks to focus on the essential ones, the guidance and navigation calculations necessary for a successful landing. 
And so on that day, during the final, terrifying moments of the Apollo 11 descent, that system was put to the ultimate test. The lunar module, the Eagle, was descending toward the Sea of Tranquility. The plan was to land with a gentle feather touch. The descent engine was firing, and the AGC was controlling it all, constantly adjusting the thrust. And that's when things began to go wrong. The issue started with a different piece of hardware, the rendezvous radar. Its purpose was to track the command module, Columbia, which was still in orbit. On the checklist, Mission Control had asked the crew to power it up. It was a standard procedure, a simple precaution. No one imagined it could cause a catastrophe. What they didn't realize was that the radar's power-up sequence was generating a flood of interrupt requests. The AGC, in its priority scheduling wisdom, saw these requests as new, urgent tasks. Each one, a new data packet from the radar, was treated as a priority, forcing the computer to interrupt its critical landing calculations. Suddenly, the AGC was being hammered by tasks it didn't need and couldn't process fast enough. And then the alarms began. The first alarm was a 12.02, then a few moments later, a 12.01. The numbers themselves meant nothing to the crew, but the klaxon they sounded told a chilling story. The AGC was overloaded. It was telling the crew, I'm running out of time to get my work done. The exhausted computer, with only 72 kilobytes of memory, was trying to process too many things at once, and it was about to fall behind. Inside the lunar module, Buzz Aldrin stared at the AGC's display. He had practiced for every contingency, but this wasn't in the playbook. He called out the alarm code to Houston. Program alarm, he said, 1202. Back in Houston, a young, brilliant guidance officer named Steve Bales was listening. He had never seen a 1202 or 1201 alarm during any simulation. But there was another voice, one he trusted implicitly, a young engineer named Jack Garman. Garman, barely 24 years old, had a cheat sheet for all the alarms, but he also remembered the lesson from Hamilton's daughter. He knew the computer was programmed for this. He remembered a simple rule his team had decided on. As long as the alarms didn't happen too often, the computer would reset and continue, throwing out the non-essential tasks. It would be okay. Bales turned to flight director Gene Kranz. Go, go, Bales said, his voice a tense, high-pitched whisper. We're go on that alarm. But the alarms didn't stop. They came again and again as the computer struggled to keep up with the cascade of unnecessary data from the rendezvous radar. Each alarm was a crisis. Each go from Houston was a leap of faith. It was a gamble on the elegant simplicity of a system that was, at that very moment, crashing. Meanwhile, Neil Armstrong, a man of profound calm, was flying the ship. He was looking out the window, looking for a landing spot. The AGC was flying them toward an area filled with house-sized boulders. Armstrong knew they couldn't land there. He had to take control. He had to fly the ship manually. This was the pivotal moment. The human pilot, 
the one whose judgment and experience were unmatched, took over from the crashing computer. But the AGC was still doing the essential work. Even while overloaded, even while crying out in alarm, it was still calculating the critical parameters for the descent. It was telling Armstrong his altitude, his vertical speed, his horizontal velocity. It was shedding the unnecessary programs and focusing on the one thing that mattered, landing the eagle safely. The AGC was not just a tool, it was a partner. It was a system designed to fail gracefully. The 1201 and 1202 alarms weren't a sign of total failure, they were a cry for help. The computer was saying, I can handle the landing, but I can't do the extra work you've asked of me. The priority scheduling system, a lesson learned from a child's accidental mistake, was working exactly as designed. It was shedding the non-essential tasks, the rendezvous radar data, to focus on the most critical job, landing on the moon. The alarms were the proof. They were the computer's way of saying, I've dropped the important tasks and am now focused entirely on the one thing that matters. Armstrong found his landing spot. He steered the eagle away from the dangerous boulders. The computer, still sounding its alarms, guided him the entire way. With just 17 seconds of fuel left, he gently touched down. Houston, he said, his voice cracking. Tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. The alarms were still sounding as he made the call. It was a testament to the system's design. The AGC, a humble computer, designed by engineers who anticipated failure, had done its job. It had prioritized what mattered most and discarded the rest. And so, Margaret Hamilton and her team built in additional error prevention software. They didn't just fix the bug, they fortified the entire system. They programmed the computer to not only recognize an overload, but to do something about it. The computer would automatically drop lower priority tasks to focus on the essential ones, the guidance and navigation calculations necessary for a successful landing. The lessons from the 1201 and 1202 alarms became the foundation for all real-time operating systems to come. We learned that a computer's true power isn't in its raw processing speed, but in its ability to manage its workload, to fail gracefully, and to communicate its state in a crisis. It's a lesson we see in everything from modern flight control systems to the software in our cars and medical devices. And what about the rendezvous radar? It turned out a simple switch had been left in the wrong position. The engineers had run thousands of simulations, but they had never thought to run one with that switch on during the descent. It was an oversight, a tiny human error that nearly ended the mission. But because of the genius of a few engineers, the foresight of a determined woman named Margaret Hamilton, a hardworking team in mission control, and the calm, under-fire determination of two astronauts, that small mistake was not a tragedy. It was a powerful, chilling moment of triumph and it stands as a testament to the idea that in the face of impossible odds, it's not just the technology that matters, it's the human intelligence and wisdom to build a system that knows when to save itself and when to let a man take the stick. The Apollo guidance computer didn't land Apollo 11 alone. It landed with a crashing computer, but it landed because the humans in the loop, on Earth and in space, knew exactly what was going on and made the right call. If you found this detailed analysis valuable, consider subscribing for more content that delves into the precise and often overlooked moments of technological history. Your engagement is what makes these explorations possible. 
Share your own insights or questions in the comments below and join the conversation.